Welcome to AP Chemistry at Hananiga High School. I'm Brian Brown, and today we'll be looking at the next two sections, Chapter 11, 11.5 and 11.6. Now, 11.5 gets into vapor pressure, which is another idea closely related to, just like everything has been in this chapter, intermolecular forces. Now, at any temperature, some molecules in a liquid have enough energy to escape. So if they've got enough kinetic energy, they can break away from the neighboring molecules, and they can become a gas. Now, as the temperature rises, the fraction of molecules that have enough kinetic energy to escape actually increases. And that's something that you can see on the picture on the left here. Now, we've looked at these recently. What type of graph is this? Because they pop up in a number of different situations. That's right, they're Maxwell-Boltzmann diagrams. In this case, we're looking at kinetic energy versus the fractional molecules, but you'll notice just like with the speed diagram, it looks very, very, very similar here. And remember, the higher temperature is the one with the lower hill but the average kinetic energy represented by that lower hill is greater. That's why it's higher temperature. Now, one of the key ideas that we can also look at with this diagram is this line right here. Now, in order to break away, you have to overcome the intermolecular forces of the neighboring molecules. So you need a certain minimum kinetic energy to do that. Well, you can see when the temperature increases in the red situation, we have a higher fraction of particles with enough energy that can break away and escape. So if we have a greater number of particles on the surface of the liquid with enough kinetic energy to escape, our evaporation rate increases. Now, as more molecules escape the liquid, you're getting a greater number of particles above the liquid. And remember, those particles exert a pressure. So as more molecules escape, the pressure they exert is going to increase. So when you heat up a liquid, its vapor pressure increases. Now, in a closed container, something special happens. The liquid and the vapor reach a state of dynamic equilibrium. In other words, the rate at which the liquid particles are becoming gas and the gas particles are going back into the liquid phase, condensation, those rates become equal. And remember, in terms of a dynamic equilibrium here, what's equal, and you may remember this from pre-AP chemistry, is the opposite rates are equal. So the rate of evaporation equals the rate of condensation. And what happens is we end up at that point with a constant pressure type situation. Now, the boiling point of a liquid is the temperature at which its vapor reaches atmospheric pressure. Because boiling is actually occurring when the vapor pressure equals the atmospheric pressure putting, pushing down. So most of us think of boiling point as like for water. Water boils at 100 degrees temperature. Well, no, it doesn't. It boils at 100 degrees Celsius when it's at one atmosphere pressure. When the pressure is greater, it's actually boil, going to boil at higher than 100 degrees Celsius. And when the pressure is less above the liquid, it's going to boil at a lower temperature, which is why it would take longer to hard boil on, on top of Mount Everest, because while you're getting to the boiling point faster, it's at a much colder temperature, less kinetic energy. It's going to cook the egg more slowly. Whereas in a pressure cooker, under a high pressure situation, you can get water to boil at a higher than 100 degrees temperature. And in a pressure cooker, you can cook your food faster then. So boiling is really a factor of um, when there's enough kinetic energy for the vapor pressure of the escaping liquid particles to, I should say, the escaping gas particles from the liquid to equal the atmospheric pressure. So when we say normal boiling point, keyword there being normal, then that's referring to normal atmospheric pressure, which would be 760 torr or 1 atm or 101.325 kPa. Under those pressures, water is going to boil at 100 degrees Celsius. So this would be the normal boiling point of water. So remember, boiling is not actually a temperature. It's a temperature at which the escaping vapor pressure equals atmospheric pressure. So it can vary. Now, why does water have a higher vapor pressure at the same temperature than ethanol and diethyl ether? So why do vapor pressures vary? Well, think about it. You have to escape. You have to overcome attractive forces. The stronger your attractive forces are, the harder it's going to be to escape. And something like water, which has hydrogen bonding, is going to be a more strongly bonded together substance. Now, ethyl alcohol also has some hydrogen bonding, but the limited nature of the shape of the molecule makes the hydrogen bonding not quite as effective, so it actually boils at a lower temperature. Its intermolecular forces are a little bit weaker. And diethyl ether, which is a very symmetrical molecule, is going to have a significantly lower boiling point. So differences in vapor pressure are all about differences in evaporation rate at given temperatures. It's all about intermolecular forces. 
Now the last section gets into phase diagram. A phase diagram is basically a, uh, a graph showing the state of the substance at various temperatures and pressures and where the different changes in state are going to occur. So you can see where you've got solids, liquids, and gases at different temperatures and pressures, and you can see all their melting points and boiling points and um, sublimation points and so on. So it's a diagram that really shows the relationship between state and the temperature and pressure of that substance. Now, the circled line you see here in this picture is the liquid vapor interface. So what we're really looking at here is vapor points. Now, way out in the far end of that line, you have um, a C, and at the beginning, you have this little point called T. Now, T is the triple point. It's the point at which all three states of matter can coexist at equilibrium. It's not having all three states of matter. It's all three states of matter at equilibrium, and that's a different situation. You basically have melting, boiling, freezing, condensing, sublimating water. Add a little bit of energy, some of the solid melts, some of the liquid boils, some of the solid sublimates. Remove a little bit of energy, and you have the exact opposite thing occurring. Some of it will deposit, go from a solid back to a uh, or a gas back to a solid, some of it will condense and some of it will freeze. And that's all happening at the same time in the same container. Well, it happens at a very specific temperature for and pressure for any substance. So it's a temperature and pressure at which all three states can exist in equilibrium. Now at the far side of that line, we've got a C. Now T stood for triple point, C stands for the critical point. If you remember back to our discussion yesterday, there was critical pressure and temperature. Well, that's really what the C is looking at. It's above this critical temperature and critical pressure, the liquid and the vapor are indis indis indistinguishable from each other. And basically above that critical temperature, um, you're going to have a gas. Now each point along the line would represent the different boiling points that the substance has. So at different pressures, at what temperature is it actually going to boil or condense? Now the line that's going up in the air, so in the middle here, that's our melting point line, and that really shows the temperatures and pressures at which you can go from a solid to a liquid and a liquid back to a solid. Like boiling, it can actually happen at different temperatures and pressures. Now, we don't really talk too much about um, changing the, the freezing point of a substance because you'll notice the, the diagram here is you know a very straight line that doesn't change much. It's got a very steep slope. So you have much smaller changes in melting point um, at different temperatures and pressures than you have at boiling point at different temperatures and pressures. But that line would represent the melting point line. Now, below the triple point of a substance, um, the substance cannot exist in the liquid state. And that's why we have dry ice. Dry ice is called dry ice. It looks like ice. It's not. It's not H2O. It's CO2. And it's dry because it never becomes a liquid under normal pressure conditions. So when you're below the triple point of a substance, you're only going to go straight from the solid to the gaseous state. In other words, it only sublimates. And that's exactly what CO2 does. Now, you can have liquid CO2. You just have to have it under higher pressure. So when we raise, raise the pressure enough and we get above the triple point, we can exist as a liquid at certain temperatures and pressures. Now, one thing that I want to point out um, on a phase diagram, notice that this substance has a very high critical temperature and pressure. Well, that's because um, there are very strong intermolecular forces, fancy name for that being van der Waal forces, that exist between water molecules. Remember, water molecules are neutral substances. Their intermolecular attractions are part of a class of, uh, of forces known as van der Waal forces. Well, water has strong hydrogen bonding. Because of that, it has a very high critical temperature and pressure. So remember, all of these things we've been talking about with liquids, boiling point, melting point, surface tension, capillary action, um, and today vapor pressure, and also critical temperature and pressure, they're all tied to intermolecular forces. Now, another thing that's important on this phase diagram, and this is something that is somewhat unique for water. There are very, very few substances that do that. The slope of the solid liquid line is actually negative. In most substances, that slope is positive. Well, that means as you pressurize the solid, it can eventually change back to a liquid. In other words, if you push it close enough together, it moves from its crystalline solid shape into its amorphous, closer to get, or should say more random, but closer together liquid state. Most substances, except for water, and there may be a few other, but off the top of my head, I can't think of any, have a positive 
line when you're looking at the melting point line. They have a positive slope. And that's because as you go from a liquid to a solid, um, when you pressurize something, you're pushing it closer together under high pressure. So water is unique in the fact that it has that negative slope there. Now, carbon dioxide would be a good example of a substance that's more normal, not in terms of the fact that it, you know, its triple point is uh, different, uh, is, is well above atmospheric pressure. That means it's dry ice. It goes from a solid straight to a gas. What's more normal about it is the slope of the line right here. This is what you'll typically see for most substances. The solid form is actually closer together, so as you pressurize it, move it closer together, it would go from a liquid to a solid. And that's true of most things, water being an exception to that. Another thing to point out here is, notice here's atmospheric pressure. Here's the triple point. That's why it's dry ice. Under atmospheric pressure, you go straight from a solid to a liquid. And those are typical points of interest, critical temperature and pressure, the C part, and the uh, triple point of a substance. Those are critical when you're looking at the substance. And that ends our second set of notes over Chapter 11.